What's up designers and welcome back to Remden Games. For those of you who have been clamoring for more AI content on this channel, strap in because this one's a doozy. Today, I'm going to be talking about a project that combines reinforcement learning, genetic algorithms, and artificial life, and was actually the foundation for the report that got me a master's degree in computer science. I'll try to cover all the main points, but this is a pretty big project and there's no way I'll be able to cover everything in this video, so if you still have questions at the end, please leave them in the comments down below, and I'll probably be making a follow-up video to answer those. First, let's go over what this project is. At its core, this project is an experiment with artificial life, also known as A-Life. A-Life is basically a field of science that deals with simulated life forms and has applications ranging from evolutionary biology to robotics. Artificial life is also a pretty common genre of video games, with games ranging from Spore to The Sims to even Tamagotchi, and is a topic I'd like to talk a lot more about in future videos on this channel. My personal interest in artificial life sprang out of my interest in monsters generally, and monster-based video games like Pokemon in particular. I love these games, but I've always wished they could be a bit more personal. Sure, these games may have hundreds of creatures to choose from, but what if the player was able to have a completely custom, unique creature that evolved just for them? There were games like Spore where the player could manually design their creatures, but what if the creature evolved naturally based on how you played the game? That concept was the inspiration behind this project. Spoiler alert, it turns out I was biting off a bit more than I could chew with those aspirations, but it at least gave me a direction to work towards. After months of research and some advice from my advisory committee, I decided on a project where instead of the creature evolving based on interactions with the user, it instead evolved to fulfill a specific task in a virtual environment. Specifically, it would learn to walk towards a particular goal location in a 3D virtual environment in the Unity game engine. There are many ways to achieve this goal, but the specific solution that I chose had two parts. The first part is the brain. My virtual character had to learn how to walk from one location to another. The second part was the body. As it learns, the creature's body evolves to get more efficient at the task. These two systems are running at the same time, and work together to get better and better at their task over time. Let's take a closer look at each of these systems individually, and then we can see what happens when they work together. Let's start with the brain. To teach my creature to walk, I used a technique called reinforcement learning, which I actually talked a little bit about in my Pokemon Emerald AI video, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. However, in that project I kind of fudged the RL. I wasn't really using it how it was supposed to be used. This project was different. RL is a really interesting tool and I made sure to make full use of it this time around. The idea behind reinforcement learning is actually very similar to the way that animals and even people learn. Suppose, for example, that you had a puppy. Really young puppies don't really know much. They'll run around, chew on everything in sight, and pee and poop wherever they want. They don't know what is right and wrong, so it's up to their owner to teach them. If they chew on something they aren't supposed to, they may be scolded, but if they obey a command, they might get pets and treats. This system of positive and negative reinforcement teaches the puppy how to behave over time. Reinforcement learning teaches machines how to behave in basically the same way. You give the machine a certain task, in this case moving towards a target goal location. At first the program has no idea how to move towards the goal location, so it basically just behaves randomly, like the puppy that goes to the bathroom wherever it wants. However, every time the virtual creature does an action, it's either rewarded for a positive action or punished for a negative action. Over time, the character eventually learns how to make choices that will give it a positive reward and avoid actions that result in punishment. Of course, a program is not the same as a puppy, so it needs a little bit more than just pets and treats. True, you need to tell the program whether it's achieved its goal or not, but you need to specify a lot of other things as well. If I told you to close your eyes and put one finger on the tip of your nose, you'd be able to do it because animals naturally know where all of their body parts are in relation to each other, even when you can't see them. 
A virtual creature, on the other hand, doesn't even really know that it has limbs, much less how to move them in a coordinated manner. Therefore, it's up to the programmer to provide information about what limbs the creature has, where they're located, how they're connected, how they're allowed to move, and so forth. For example, you have to specify how the lower legs are connected to the upper legs and how much each body part is allowed to move around each of its joints. Similarly, animals have senses such as sight, hearing, touch, and smell that they can use to explore their environment. A virtual creature has no senses, unless the programmer provides them. Basically, it's up to the programmer to specify what the character can learn about its environment. For this project, the character knew things like where the goal was, which direction it was facing, and how fast it was moving. Providing all of this information is necessary for the creature to learn and get better at its job over time. After all, it wouldn't be very good at finding a goal location if it had no way of knowing where the goal was. Another thing I specified for this project was a curriculum. A curriculum is basically a way of adjusting the difficulty of the reinforcement learning task over time so that the task gets more difficult as the character gets better at doing it. This isn't strictly necessary, but really helps training go more quickly. In this case, the main thing that I changed with my curriculum was how far away the goal was. Because the creatures basically learn through trial and error, if you start out with the goal really far away, it's unlikely for them to ever reach it. Because of this, I started with the goal pretty close at first, and slowly getting further away as the creature learns over time. While specifying all this information ahead of time can be really time consuming, the amazing thing about reinforcement learning is that once you get the program started, it's completely hands off. It's actually pretty magical. You just let the program do its thing and watch as it begins learning in front of your very eyes, often in ways you never could have predicted. While reinforcement learning provides the brain, for this project I was also interested in involving the creature's body. In the real world, animals evolve different shapes for different tasks, and I wanted my virtual creature to do the same thing. To do so, I once again took inspiration from real world biology and used what is called a genetic algorithm. A genetic algorithm is a type of computer program that mimics the evolution of real living things, such as animals or plants. For a genetic algorithm to work, we can't just have one single thing. We actually need a larger population of creatures. For this project specifically, we used a population size of 10 creatures. These creatures then train for a certain amount of time using reinforcement learning, which we discussed previously. Then, after training for a while, each creature will have a score. Remember how I said that different actions will result in either punishment or reward? Well, if you add up all of those punishments and rewards over the entire training period, you'll get the creature's score, which tells you how well they did overall at achieving their goals. Creatures who got better scores will then go on to become the parents of the next generation, while those who didn't do very well will be removed from the population. In this way, the entire population of creatures will gradually get better over time. Copying useful traits from your parents is an important part of evolution both in the real and virtual worlds, but it's only part of the puzzle. If you just keep copying traits from previous generations, then you're never going to end up with anything really new, and you might end up in a situation where everything ends up being very similar, but not necessarily well suited for the task. This is called a local optimum. To understand local optimums, imagine you're in an area with lots of hills. You want to climb to the top of the highest hill around. So what do you do? Pretty easy, you just find the tallest hill that you can see and start climbing. But now imagine that it's a really foggy day and you can only see a few feet around you in any direction. You can't even see the entire hill that you're on, so how do you climb to the top? The best you can do is look around you and see what is higher than where you are and what is lower and start moving to the highest point that you can see in your immediate area. However, once you get to the top, you're basically stuck because now everything around you is lower than where you are. There may be a much taller hill somewhere else, but you have no way of knowing about it. This is basically what happens when a program gets stuck in a local optimum. There may be a better solution somewhere, but it has no real way of finding it. This is why you need mutation. 
it adds additional randomness which makes it less likely for you to get stuck on a lower hill. In this project, mutation occurs when moving from one generation of creatures to the next. Usually the creatures will just copy traits from its parents, but every now and then it will come up with completely new original traits. If you put these systems together, you end up with a genetic algorithm that copies successful traits from previous generations, but has enough variety to hopefully stop from getting stuck in a local optimum trap. Now that we've established our two systems, reinforcement learning for teaching and genetic algorithms for evolution, all we need to do is actually run the program. This program was ran in the Unity 3D game engine, and I actually tested several different configurations. I ran each configuration for 600 generations, and tracked their average performance on these charts. It's not important to know what all the different configurations are. The two that I really want to draw your attention to are these two. The first was my best performing model. The second was the control model which is exactly the same except it only includes the reinforcement learning without the genetic algorithm. The main reason I tested a model without the genetic algorithm was to see whether it actually improved performance. It was possible that having a single fixed body shape would make it easier for the reinforcement learning brain to work, and this might actually be better. Fortunately, this was not the case. The model with the genetic algorithm strongly outperformed the model without. Now let's talk about results. The unmutated model looks like this, and the output of my best performing model ended up like this. They not only look very different, but they also developed very different movement styles. The unmutated model mostly slid along on its belly like a caterpillar, whereas the mutated model kind of spun around like a top. While this experiment was a success in many ways, it also had a number of flaws. First, neither the creature's bodies nor the way they moved really resembled any real-world animals. I think this was due to a lack of constraints. Real-world animals actually have a lot more limitations on how they move than this virtual creature did. For example, Real-world animals tend to avoid spinning because they get dizzy, and animals also tend to like to look at what they're moving towards. In addition, we like to keep our bodies upright and our heads relatively still. It's possible that if I would have added more constraints like these, I would have gotten more realistic results. Second, I originally intended to test these creatures in a variety of different situations including gaps, obstacles, slopes, and possibly even water. But due to time constraints, I had to scale it back and only tested them in a single, relatively simple environment. However, it's still possible that I may expand the possibilities in the future, probably after I finish my Emerald AI. Finally, while this technique is interesting, it's definitely not the kind of thing you'd want to put in a creature-based video game, so I didn't really succeed in that goal. However, doing research and working on this project has definitely taught me a lot, and I have other ideas that I think would work much better in a video game environment, which I can talk about in future videos. That's all I have for today. If you like this video and want to see more AI, programming, or artificial life videos, make sure you leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss more videos like this in the future. If you want to see more, you should definitely check out my other videos, like my previous one where I talk about the history of the sport of basketball and how the design of the rules changed over time. I also have nearly 150 articles on the Remton Games blog, which you can check out at the link in the description down below. And join me next week for my next entry in the Evolution of Pokemon design series where we are all the way up to Generation 7. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.